there is an army rising. The church is the breathing grounds for raising godly men and women who are willing to apply kingdom principles and values to bring transformation to their respective societies. We need to have a national focus. We don't have to lose this ambition or else we work against the Great Commission. They are equipped in righteousness. Unless our righteousness exceeds those who just know ABC and sometimes others to do, but they don't do unless we see that. We pray for God to raise right ministers in our nations. We pray for God to raise right tax collectors. We pray for God to raise right security agents. Achoo, achoo. They are bold and fearless. Standing your ground when the battle has been heated to such an extent that everyone is running away. But we don't quit, for we know no defeat. The agenda to possess the nations. Welcome to an equipping center of the word and prayer on Pentecost hour. Stay tuned in. The Bible tells us that the word of God that we are talking about is the sword of the spirit. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6, 17 gives us take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So we are to take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So the Bible that we have in our hands is a sword and it is a sword of the spirit. And every army of course are given some kind of armory. And if God is giving us a weapon which is the sword and he's calling the sword of the spirit which is the word of God then as an army of God, this must be very, very important to us so far as our lives are concerned. Of course, we are into a battle, but as we've said, it is not a physical battle. It is a spiritual battle that God is going to use us to do. It is a battle to take the nations of the kingdom of darkness for the kingdom of God's dear son, that is Jesus Christ. So that is the kind of battle that we are engaged in. And the kingdom of darkness here includes the spiritual and moral darkness in our societies. The spiritual and moral darkness in our societies. So it is not a battle that we are going to take some guns and other things to go and start killing people. No. It is a battle of the spirit. And it is a battle that we need to allow God to use us to fight. It is a battle against both spiritual and moral darkness in our societies. Some of these things found in our cultures, in our traditions, various ideologies, and national policies that are set against the purpose of God. There are some national policies that are set against the purpose of God. And God wants to use us to straighten them. And also people who are under the rule of the evil one. There are some people who have been so consumed by Satan that everything that they do, they do for Satan. But we pray that God will help us. So first of all, we want to look at what the word of God is. We want to create a test and an interest in it. We also want to look at the word of God as a sword. So what is the word of God, the Bible? And we also want to see it, look at the word of God as a sword. And not only that, the word of God also as a sword of the spirit. So it is a sword. But what kind of a sword? It is the sword of the spirit. Under it, we will consider the nature and purpose of the sword of the spirit. We will also try to identify our enemies in the battle. Who are our enemies in the battle? And finally, we will finish with suggested practical mechanisms to equip the church with the word of God for the combat. Hallelujah. So how are we going to equip ourselves? Uh, I will jump over so many things because of time, and I will try to bring out a few things which I think will profit us. Now, but one important thing I first of all want us to have in our mind is that when we talk about the word of God, when we talk about the Bible, 
You are talking about the Bible we hold. Uh, first, we have the hard copies. Those who have the hard copies, please, can you raise it? If you have the hard copy. Yes, you can raise it. This is what we are talking about. What we have in our hands, this is the Bible. And then, as the world advances, we now have the word of God electronically on our phones and iPads and other places. So the word of God that we are talking about is just that. The Bible that we have in our hands and the word of God that we have on our iPhones or on our phones and then on our iPads and other gadgets that we have. So that is the Bible that we are talking about. So no matter where you read it from, note that you have the word of God. And the Bible is telling us that this word of God that we have is the sword of the spirit. So that as we handle them, whether electronically or hard copies in our hands, let's know that we are holding a very important tool. A very important weapon that God has given to us. And that we shouldn't play with it. Hallelujah. So this is very, very important. And talking about the word of God, I say that it is simply a collection of God's inspired words spoken or written for human beings as a result of his in, uh, interactions with them. You read scripture and we realize that the whole scripture is about God's relationship with certain people. How God related with them, how God spoke to them, the way that God wanted them to live. And it is these interactions between human beings and God that God has allowed these things to be written down for us through the work of the Holy Spirit so that as we study, we begin to know how God wants us to live as human beings, how he wants us to relate to him. So in these collections, God made sure he made his plans and his mind and his will known through the writings. Hallelujah. So as we read scripture, we should see that it is God relating to people. That is why the Bible shouldn't be uh, uh, something that is abstract. The scriptures should be alive. Hallelujah. When we are reading scripture, know that it is alive. It is something that we can relate to. Because it speaks about God's relationship and God's interaction with certain people. And it is these things that have been recorded for us. And I pray that we will know these things and then allow ourselves for God to cause them to be seen in our life. So it is a history of God's interaction with people. But then we want to know that it is not just a history book. It is the word of God. It reveals God's intents, that is his plan, and his purposes for mankind. It reveals God's intents and his plans that he has for mankind. It thus contains the precepts and principles of faith, the things that we need to live our lives as Christians, our guidelines and everything are in there. The Bible has therefore been described as the manual of life for the believer. So the Bible is the manual of life for the believer. Since it contains all a person needs for his life journey, both spiritual and physical on this earth. As a manual then, one needs to interact with it by disciplines such as daily reading, studying, meditating on its words, praying with it, memorizing, reciting, confessing, and practically living by it, among others. So these are some of the things that we need to equip ourselves. So the Bible is a history. But one thing about the Bible is that I think that the Bible is God himself. Hallelujah. Because if anybody wants to know about God, we will know about God from scriptures. And in fact, from Genesis to Revelation, God unveils himself to us. As we read the Bible, we see God. 
As we read the Bible, we see God. So no wonder John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Hallelujah. So the Bible that we have in our hands is God himself. So as I carry my Bible along, I should know that I am holding God, I'm carrying God. I'm going with God in my hands. If it is on my phone or any other gadgets, let me know that this thing that I'm holding, whenever I open it up, this is God. Hallelujah. So I say that God and his word, I will not use our, God and his word is one. I'm not going to use our. God and his word is one. What it means is that you cannot separate God and his word. God is so united and God is so found in his word that he cannot be separated from his word. So God and his word for me is one. There is no difference. But one amazing thing about the word of God is that we see the entire trinity within the word of God, within the Bible. Hallelujah. We receive the word of God through the Holy Spirit's inspiration. The entire trinity is there. Now the Bible is telling us God, or the word of God, is God. We can bring in God the Father here. And then Jesus Christ is God's word in the flesh. So the Bible that we are holding is a very special book. It's unique. We see the involvement of the Godhead, the Holy Trinity, inside the development of the Bible. And when we read the scriptures, we see their actions and activities within the scriptures. It is a wonderful book. Oh, hallelujah. It is a wonderful book. And that is how we want to see the word of God. Now, if you see the word of God this way, you will know the way that you want to handle it. But as I've said, the word of God, yes, is the Bible. But then the Bible tells us this word of God is a sword. It is not just a Bible. It is not just words that have been written. It is also a sword. Hallelujah. So it is a weapon that God has given to us. And that God wants us to use that weapon to honor his name. So the Bible, which is described to us in various images, various speakers have spoken about it, has been also pictured as the sword. So the word of God is sword. We'll read about some of these things later. And talking about the sword, in both ancient Greek and Greco-Roman world, the sword was the most important weapon of warfare. Talking about the sword. So talking about the sword, this sword that we are talking about is related to what the ancient Near East world and the Roman world used. That is what is being compared to. And for these words, the sword was a very important weapon of warfare. It had various lengths ranging from 16 inches to 3 feet. It was used as both a defensive and an offensive weapon. So they used the sword as both offensive and at the same time a defensive weapon. What it means is that later we are going to recognize that the Bible that we have in our hands can be used or is to be used as both a defensive and an offensive weapon. So let's have that one in mind. We cannot look into the history of the sword that the Romans used. But the sword nature of the word of God has been so labeled because of its ability to pierce the human heart. The sword nature of the word of God has been so labeled because of its ability to pierce into the hearts of humanity. It is able to pierce. We read Isaiah chapter 49 verse 2. Isaiah 49 verse 2 reads, He made my mouth 
like a sharpened saw. This is a prophet speaking. He said, he made my mouth as a sharpened saw. What it means is that the words that God put into the mouth of the prophet to speak were like saw. And when people heard it, it pierced through them. So the word of God that we have is a saw. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 also read. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 also read. For the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hallelujah. So we are describing the word of God as a sword because of its ability to pierce, to penetrate. It is my prayer that even as we handle the word of God, as we read, as we study, as we meditate upon them, as we pray, as we read, God will cause these words to penetrate into our hearts. It is then and only then that God is going to circumcise our hearts. God must circumcise our hearts. I normally say that, saying it in tree, I tell people, we need to allow God to destroy our heart, if you like. It doesn't mean that he's destroying it so that we will die, but he will destroy and then build it up again. Because our old nature with the heart and with the things that we have in us does not glorify God. And it is when our hearts have been circumcised that is when we begin to live as Christians that God wants us to be. It is my prayer that as we handle the word of God, as we study the word of God, we should allow the word of God to pierce into our hearts, to break us so that God can use it to honor his name. In Acts chapter 2 verse 37, we read that when the people heard this, Thus, Peter's words on the day of Pentecost, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So, if a Christian, you listen to the word of God and you don't have this kind of effect within you, then there is something wrong. I am praying that God will cause his word to be so effective and sharp within us and touch our hearts in such a way that our hearts will be circumcised so that we will make ourselves available to God for God to honor his name in our life. Yesterday when the general secretary was speaking, there is something that I was thinking about. And that was the fact that there is a scripture that I read so many years back which cut through my heart. And that is what brought transformation to me. We're reading from 1 John chapter 2, 15. 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. It reads, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forevermore. This is what brought a change, a transformation into my life. Why? Because those times... As young as I was, I knew I loved God. And I wanted my love for God and his love for me to continue. So when I read this and it said, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. And that is where the slashing came. If you love the world, the love of the Father 
or the love for the Father is not in you. And I said, how? How can I live? Because I want to love God. And if these things will prevent me from loving God and God loving me, then they must go. That is where I had my circumcision. It pierced through my heart. And it changed my life forever. I am praying that God will help us. That even as we look into his word, we will not just read it. The word of God must have a kind of an effect on us. So that we will be able to glorify his name. It says that for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh is everywhere. The lust of the eye is everywhere. The pride of life comes not from the father that we want to love. But it comes from the world. A sharp cut. I said, wow. If this is the case, then these things must leave me. And I thank God that the Lord helped me. Hallelujah. And 17 says that the world and its desires pass away. Now these things that are going to hinder my love for God and God's love for me, they are not eternal things. They are going to pass away. There are so many things that we allow ourselves to be engaged in, but there are things that are going to pass away. The Bible says that a time will come that there's going to be a shaking. And in that shaking, things that are not eternal will be shaking. They'll be taken away. So I want to focus on things that are eternal so that when there is a shaking, I'll be able to stand. I pray that God will grant me this grace in the name of Jesus. And God will give you this grace so that you can live as a true Christian to honor God. Shall we be on our feet? Oh, I no quare Hallelujah, no quare to mean it. Let God circumcise your heart. The sword of God must pierce inside you. You must feel it. You must feel it. That something is slashing you. And when that is settled, you will never remain the same. You become a different person. You become the person that God wants. No addiction can keep you when your heart is circumcised. This is what we want God to do in our lives. Shall we pray? Shall we pray?
or the salt that we possess. It is the sword of God. But it is not just a sword. It is also the sword of the Spirit. It is not a physical sword. Hallelujah. It is the sword of the Spirit. And that is how we need to look at the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's read 13 to 17. Ephesians chapter 6. 13 to 17. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may, not, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. So the word of God is not just a sword. It is a sword of the Spirit. And it is one of the armor that God has provided for the church. But there is something I want us to note before I go on. From verse 13 and 14. It says that we should put on the whole armor of God so that we will be able to stand our ground. And after we have done everything, also to stand, we must stand therefore. Hallelujah. We are noting three stands. Three stands. And I'm seeing a stand before, during, and after. Our battle. A stand, first stand before, another one during, and another one after. Now the first stand that we read from verse 13 says that so that you may be able to stand your ground. This is a stand that is during. When there are battles and we have armed ourselves with this armor that God has provided, we'll be able to stand no matter the battle. No matter the situation that you find yourself, no matter the temptation that will come your way, you'll be able to stand. So we need these things to be able to stand during the war, during the battle. But it also says that, and after you have done everything, to stand. So that talks about standing after. So we are standing during, and we are also standing after. It shouldn't happen that after the war, then you fall. No. After the battle, after the fall, uh, 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 the engagements with the devil and things that disturb us, at the end of the day, we should be able to stand. Which means that that which God will be able to use to make us stand must be very powerful. Because it should be able to sustain us during the battle. And then after the battle, we should be able to stand. So 14 says that stand firm then, or if you like, therefore stand, or stand therefore. And this for me is the standing before. So before the battle comes, I should be somebody who is standing. And this calls for equipping myself with the whole armor of God, of which one is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. So before the battle, I should be standing. Stand firm then, or stand firm therefore. So I see the 14, the first one in 14, as the one that we need before the war. And then I'm seeing the first one that appears in verse 13 as a standing during, and then the last one also in verse 13 as a standing after. So that God has given us this armor so that we'll be able to stand in our Christian life and honor God. I pray that God will help us. Hallelujah. So, that is the sword of the Spirit. One of the things that God has given to us. So, it is not just a sword. It is the sword of the Spirit. And as, a, as the sword of the Spirit, 
There are three natures of the spirit, of the sword of the spirit that we want to know. The first one is that the sword of the spirit is not a sword of man. That is why it is not a physical sword. It is not a sword of man. It is not a sword of man. It says the sword of the spirit. A sword of means it belongs to the spirit of God. And he is also the source of this source. So the word of God that we have, which is the word of uh, the sword of the spirit, is not a sword of man, but it is the sword of the spirit. Hallelujah. Because of time, we will not be able to look at some of the references. But the second characteristic is that the sword of the spirit is God himself. I've already said it, that the Bible is God. That one too we need to keep. So that is the nature of the sword of the spirit. It is not a sword of man. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. It is something that has come from the spirit of God. And it is God himself. This makes the sword of the spirit exceptional. Though all the armor come from God, this piece of armor is God himself. It is God himself. And as I said, it is the tripartite God. It is the Godhead himself. Hallelujah. The next or the third one is that the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon mentioned among the armor of God. It is the only offensive weapon that is mentioned among the armor of God. All the rest are, if you like, potentially or primarily, all of them are defensive. But the sword of the spirit is both defensive and it is also offensive. Hallelujah. But one special thing that I note among all the weapons is that each of them also relies on the sword of the spirit or relies on the word of God. If you talk about the truth, truth depends on the word of God. Truth, the belt of truth that we need to buckle our waist with depends on the word of God because the word of God is truth and it is out of the word of God that we get truth. The breastplate of righteousness, focusing on righteousness, comes from the word of God. We also realize that the gospel itself, which is the gospel of peace, is definitely the word of God. And then the shield of faith. Without the word of God, you will not have faith. So faith depends on the word of God. The helmet of salvation, our salvation, our confidence in our salvation depends on the word of God because it is the word of God that has taught us. So you realize that all the other armor that we, we, we talk about all have a kind of relationship with the word of God. This is God himself and it is God who makes himself known to us. I pray that we will see this and then allow God to be with us. So this is the only offensive weapon among all the others. But let me say that because all of them depends on the word of God, God in, God in his own sovereignty can make any of them, being who he is, to be an offensive weapon as and when he wants. Hallelujah. Because all of them depends on the word of God. And God can do anything that he wants to do. We don't want to limit God. Though the sword of the spirit is given by God, belongs to the Holy Spirit, it is God himself, and both a defensive and an offensive weapon for the Christian, it requires that we use it correctly for the purpose for which it has been given. This also requires that the church must be equipped properly with the word of God for maximum impact. So if this is how the word of God is, then there is the need for us to be equipped with the word of God. What is the purpose of the sword of the spirit? The purpose of the sword of the spirit. And here too, as I said, there are two things. It's the same as looking at the Roman sword. They are used for offensive and defensive. So I've already indicated that the word of God is a defensive 
weapon. The sword of the spirit is a defensive weapon. And as a defensive weapon, it is the Christian's strength. That is our strength. Just as the Roman soldier is strong and fearless to fight, whenever he has the sword, so if the Christian is full of the word of God, they will have the strength and courage to face any situation they are confronted with and then overcome. So the sword of the spirit gives us strength as a defensive weapon. We are able to move. Jesus Christ did it. When Satan confronted him, the Bible says that for three times he said, it is written, this was his strength. And when he said that, Satan had to flee from him because he couldn't stand. It is our strength. The next thing is that it provides the Christian the needed context for the warfare. And I've said it is not an even ground. Satan doesn't fight with us with any strategy. So he can come from any angle, he can do anything that he wants. But if we are so soaked up with the word of God, we'll be able to confront him. The Christian should know that the character of the enemy and how he operates. We must know and understand the ground on which we stand and the protections and privileges at our disposal. All this come by way of the word of God. So it is the word of God that helps us and it helps us to define our context and also be able to fight against the devil who does not come on, on an even ground. Now, if you study about the temptation of Jesus, you realize that Satan wanted to trick Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, 5, and 6, you realize that Satan wanted to quote Psalm 91, 11 to 12. Psalm 91, 11 to 12. But when he tried quoting it, he left something out. But Jesus Christ knew. So, Psalm 91, 11 reads, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. To guard you in all your ways. But when Satan was quoting it in Matthew chapter 6 verse 4, uh, 4 verse 6, he said, he will command his angels concerning you. He left to guard you in all your ways. So he misquoted it. That is what he did to Eve in the garden. He misquoted it. So it is the word of God that helps us to know the context. Satan is rough. And he can come in any form. There are so many things that we read on social media. There are a lot of information that we get. And if you are not very careful, you start believing some of them. Let me advise that anytime you read anything, compare it with the word of God and ask yourself, is this what the word of God says? We should have that confidence in the word of God. Hallelujah. And it is when we have that confidence that we'll be able to stand. And Jesus, knowing the mind of Satan that he was trying to trick him, he was trying to take him off his feet, Jesus said that it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So he realized Satan wanted to test him. It is because he had the word of God in him. He knew the full task. And he didn't allow Satan to deceive him. The next thing is that the sword of the spirit sets the needed standards for the Christian. The needed standards for the Christians. The standard that we need to be able to live as Christians. Of course, a godly life. And yesterday, the Jesus spoke about holiness. God wants us to live right. And once we decide to live right, God will honor his name. You know, here too, Satan wanted to trick Jesus Christ. And he said that Jesus should bow down a little for him. And he will give everything to him. Now, it is not everything that he wanted to give. He just wanted Jesus Christ, if you like, to sin. To go against the will of God. Because the will of God for us is that he is the only one that must be worshipped. But Satan was diverting his attention to a different worship. To worship him. And Jesus said, no way. He was not going to do that. And these are some of the things that we need to have in our mind. And that is what the word of God does in us. The word of God also as an offensive tool 
So all that we looked at were the defensive one. As an offensive tool, we want to realize that the purpose of the spirit for the Christian is to properly wield it as an offensive tool. The purpose for the sword of the spirit for the Christian is to be able to use it as an offensive tool to destroy or to permanently damage every spiritual enemy that Satan brings our way. As the only Christian offensive weapon, the Bible's use in this fashion becomes indispensable since we must not only defend ourselves in the battle, but also to win and defeat the enemy completely. We must also attack. We must consequently strike and strike very hard with the sword. Once again, let us note that Jesus used the sword to overcome the devil. Hallelujah. So we must use it as an offensive. When Satan come, face him with the word of God. And once you do that, Satan will flee. The identification of our enemies. Of course, we are talking about first enemy, Satan and his cohorts, or Satan and his demons, or those that he works with. So that is the first one. You can read 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 to 9. We are not going to read. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. And then Ephesians 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. You can read that one. And the next enemy, I call it the battle of the mind. The battle of the mind. That is where the war is. So the war is not only against Satan and his cohorts, but it's also against the battle of the mind or things that go through our mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. We, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. In the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So let's note strongholds. So these strongholds are what I'm calling the battle of the mind. Things that goes on within our minds and our hearts, which must be demolished. And Paul has to define these things for us. So from verse 5 he says, we demolish arguments. So this stronghold includes arguments. And then every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. There are things that stand up against the knowledge of God. These are things that go on in our mind. And he said we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So there are certain thoughts that come which are not under the control of the Spirit of God or under the control of the Word of God. And these things we must face with the Word of God. So we need to bring all these things under the obedience of Christ. And verse 6 says, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So there are certain things going on which are arguments, various pretensions set up against the knowledge of God, and certain thinking which does not come under the obedience of Christ or under the word of God. These things must be captured. And these are the areas that we fight against. We pray that God will grant us the strength to be able to fight against these things and to honor God in our life. That is our next contest. It's against people's resistance to the gospel of Christ by human philosophy, human rationalism, human empiricism, and the human process of intelligence. And some of these things, when we read books, we go to the social media in our lecture rooms. Yesterday, some of us asked questions on them. Satan brings these things, and you need the word of God to face it. Because if the word of God is not in you, you will not be able to handle them. We need the word of God so that as and when they come, you will face it with the word of God. It is also a fight against everything that lifts itself up in opposition to the knowledge of God. 
The things that we hear, the things that we see, the things that we read, are they in opposition to the will of God or to the knowledge of God? We need to note them. Whether arrogant thought or anything that takes the place of God or the place that God rightly holds. And we are talking about things that are like the LGBTQI agenda. That is now all over the world. When these things come, let's look at them very well and let the word of God speak into them. Hallelujah. And God wants us to resist these things. And when we want to resist, they will leave. So how do we equip ourselves? There are many ways by which we can equip ourselves with the word of God. But I thank God for the life of David. When David was going to meet Goliath, God has actually equipped him so that when we met Goliath, he was able to overcome him. When we read 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 37, 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 37, we read, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, a youth like ourselves. And he has been a warrior also from his youth. So from his youth, Goliath had been fighting. That is why he's still killing people. But then David had also started. So he was also going to be a conqueror, a victor over his enemies. Hallelujah. That is why I think that at this age, we need to give ourselves to the word of God. Goliath started when he was youth. David started when he was a youth. We must also start. Hallelujah. We must also start. 34 says that, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion or a bear comes and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the power of the lion and the power of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul then said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Hallelujah. David spoke to him about his experience with God, his work with God. What will help us as believers to overcome our enemies is we equipping ourselves. That is before there is any war, we must make sure we are fully armed. And because David was fully armed, <laughs> he saw Goliath. All the Israelites were shivering when he spoke. But for him, he knew he could overcome him. Hallelujah. And when Goliath saw him, he, he thought that he was just seeing a small boy who didn't have anything to do. A nice boy, stay somewhere. You want to come and fight me? And he was wondering why he was coming to him with sticks and stones and other things. But they were not just sticks and stones. They were sticks and stones, all right. But so far as it is in the hands of David, they carried power. They carried power. Because he had a close encounter with God. And they carried power. So that once we are saturated with the word of God, no matter whatever happens or whatever we have in our hands, God is able to give us a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Even in our studies, God will be there to give us a breakthrough. In our various businesses, what things seem so hard or so difficult, when we are saturated with the word of God, and have that close relationship with God, God will come in, God will intervene and bring a breakthrough. Hallelujah. And that is what we have to do with our lives as Christians so that we don't go to battle and fall, but we go to battle and win. Hallelujah. So verse 50 of the same 1 Samuel chapter 17, 
reads that, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. How possible? Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's wear, a sword, and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Hallelujah. So David did not only conquer Goliath, he conquered the entire Philistines because he was saturated with God. He was saturated with the presence of God. May the presence of God saturate us. Hallelujah. May we make ourselves available so that the word of God will so fill us and saturate us. So that wherever we find ourselves, we go in the mighty name of the Lord God Almighty. And when we go with this name, because God has filled us, don't forget that the word of God is God himself. And once we are filled with the word of God, we are filled with God. We have the whole tripartite God living in us. And once we are full of this God, we'll be able to overcome all our enemies and things that stands against us. So there is the need for us to equip ourselves. May the Lord God Almighty continue to be with us. May the Lord God Almighty continue to strengthen us and direct us towards giving ourselves to being equipped by the word of God so that we'll be able to honor his name. May the Lord God Almighty bless all of us. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening to today's word. Subscribe to our social media handles for life-transforming messages.